man, it all comes down to this, and it's bye-bye birdie by the end of the fucking thing, all told. Uh, for those who were wondering, speculating, hypothesizing, was there going to be a third season of Iron-Blooded Orphans? Was there going to be a follow-up OVA or a follow-up movie? While the latter of those two are still certainly possible by some stretch of the imagination, um, I think this episode pretty much put a definitive cap on the story by the end, and happily so, as far as I'm concerned. I thought everything came to fruition in a very satisfying way. I, I didn't feel like any part of it felt rushed. All of the lingering questions were answered. All of the lingering things to be said were said by the end. And then we skip ahead a little bit. We, we time jump ahead and we follow up with these surviving characters. And it's all utmost satisfying to me. I, I don't think it could have been any more satisfying than it was. Even up to and including the character deaths in this episode, most notably on the sort of the hero side, you know, Mika and Akihiro, um, even with their deaths, even with their demise, I, I feel satisfied. I feel like it's kind of passing beyond the old guard. You know, you can't have the beasts of old lording over the future. You know, it's kind of like breaking away from religion in a sense where you want to live for yourself, your your own pursuits, ambitions, your own satisfaction. You don't need something overlording you and, and demeaning you and kind of confining you. And in a sense, arguably so, if Orga, if Mika, if Akihiro, if these characters had survived, I mean, you know, objectively so, they were the ones with the bloodiest hands ever since going back to episode one of season one. You know, these were some of the dirtiest dogs in the Tekadon pile. And while that isn't to say some of the survivors were, were blood free, were, were, you know, guilt free in any of their actions that they undertook, but most of them were fending for their lives and they were following the orders of Orga and things like that. And, and Orga, Mika, all these characters they weren't afraid to get down and dirty. They weren't afraid to make it about retribution and make the wrong sorts of choices. And uh, it, it just, it, it was outstanding to me that by the end, we we see the sort of dreams become manifest. The hopes and dreams of people like Orga Itsuka, people like Fareed McGillis, ironically, with them taken out of the world, their dreams become manifest. And and by that rationale, you could say Tekadon, Orga achieved his goal with the help of you know Mika and Akihiro in this episode the actions they took they succeeded by the end and and that's really what was tantamount to me so even though we lose characters like Mika Mika was a character who there was a lot of speculation you know it was very divisive amongst people watching the series even amongst myself I was very much middle ground of uncertainty was he going to live survive go on to have a family become a farmer or was he going to go berserker and meet his untimely demise. And as we see, I mean, he went out flailing for all of Rustal and Arian Rod's, uh, you know, eloquent speech about these are no more than beasts and, and all these human debris, they're animals and they have to be put down and all this stuff. For all of these, you know, sort of <laughs> terminologies that they're putting forth about Tagadon, how could they miss the mark that, you know, if you back a beast into a corner, if it's just you know, within grasp of its own losing its life, surely it's going to come out of that corner going apeshit. It's going to come out guns blazing with nothing left to lose. It has nothing left to lose, obviously. It's going to fight to the bitter end, and it's going to take as many of you cocksuckers with it as it can, and that's exactly what Mika does. He throws down anything that gets in his way, he destroys. And uh, in Akihiro's case, I was kind of surprised that Akihiro met his end, but it, it was, again, a really befitting end, because by the end of it all, he realizes, he recognizes that name, Eok, that cocksucking pussy bastard, and it's it's so satisfying and befitting that he was the one to crush the life out of this piece of shit you know finally this piece of shit once again like all of the stupid mistakes he's made in the past he goes running into this battle thinking he's going to make a name for himself he's got to get some comeuppance for the people who lost their lives to save his and all this shit he's not thinking he, he is not in any way analytical he he's not a tactician he's simply running by the seat of his pants and the seat of his own emotions and he walked right into his own fucking death, and I couldn't have been more satisfied by that. I was sad to see Akihiro go. I mean, he was a good cat, uh, even though his his hands were were dirty as well. Uh, you know, he he is representative of the old guard, and he kind of had to be a shoot for that future to have its living, breathing purpose. And uh, in the case of Mika, I mean, it came down to Mika versus Julieta, and that was a really intriguing 
you know, versus matchup in this episode for me, because I, I have talked about Juliet at first. I really hated her when, when she was very much simpatico with the yoke and everything like that. Um, but I began to see her breaking away from yoke and still following her own idealism, you know, still following her own sort of, uh, uh, self-satisfying goals and everything, what she held dear to her, her mission statement, if you will. And it's so interesting that in the midst of this battle, Julieta versus Mika, there's a point where she's trying to understand what Mika's impetus is, what his driving force is. She doesn't have all of the information. She is very much still, even at this late stage, that lamb lost in the woods, as I described her as, because she there's so much she's unaware of. She is confronted with Mika. She She's the one who is going to end his life for all intents and purposes. And she's still pleading with him to understand what his motivation is. Doesn't he have a goal? Isn't he trying to accomplish something? She cannot conceive because she there's so much of that information she doesn't have. She's only going by by what Rustal and Arianrod and Gallahorn and, and those types of uh, organizations have told her. So she doesn't understand. She can't conceive of the fact that what Mika is doing is potentially buying time, trying to save the lives of the rest of Tekadon, make a prosperous future for those survivors. She doesn't know that. She doesn't understand that. She can't conceive of that. And so she is <laughs> sort of, you know, counterproductively, whether you want to say that, or, or, or you know, counterintuitively, whatever, you know, she is hailed as the one who destroyed the devil himself, beheaded the devil, and and showed that head to the rest of Arian Rod, which at that point they really needed because Arian Rod, they were full of really superstitious idiots. I mean, with Mika going full fledged and Barbados going full fledged, I mean, he's losing consciousness. He's on his way out. He's dying. And that Alea Viana system, however that's pronounced, you know, it's just no holds barred at that point because of that fact. And, and they're seeing literally like supernatural speed in the movements of Barbados and and the rebake and everything like that and they're just absolutely gobsmacked they don't know what to make of it it's probably all unfolding in in almost pseudo slow motion to them watching from afar because they just they can't believe the shit that is happening I mean in one minute there are a bunch of mobile armors standing there mobile suits standing there waiting to take on Mika and the next thing they know in a flash boom bang they're rubble <laughs> there's so much debris and being that it's at the hands of a kid who all his life has been human debris, again, there's a poetic justice to that. So by the end, with Julieta taking the day, taking the win in a sense, little could she know that she she was able to answer to Mika's own mission statement, answering to those final orders of Orga in saving Tekadon's life. They got through the tunnel. These characters survive, and I was just really happy about that. By the time everything is said and done... Am I thoroughly shocked and bewildered by the fact that Rustal and Cudelia have a peace agreement between their two representative factions? In a sense, you could say Tekadon, not only Tekadon, but even Fareed McGillis in his own demise, would his most idealized hopes and dreams come true? The reformation of Gallahorn, bringing it back to being a democratic, you know, sort of governmental party, uh, uh, you know, and, and rather than an empirical one. Similarly with Mars, all of the uh, sort of strong-armed, you know, Earth forces and governmental factions have removed themselves from from Mars, so Mars can be its own governing body now. And this was really what Tachydon and what Fareed McGillis both sought to do. And it's just really ironic that it ends up coming at the hands of Rustal and Cudelia, who have made this amends, who have made this, you know, peace treaty uh, amongst themselves, and, and really... The focus of which, even going that much further, is to make sure there are no more human debris. That they abolish that entire concept. That they make the lives of these orphaned children all over the Earth, all over Mars. They make those lives prosperous and happy. And, and a lot of the survivors of Tekadon are the caregivers and even overwhelmed. Uh, <laughs> you know, in the case of the one guy he needs, I think it was Dante, he needs more help, uh, he's telling Cordelia. And it was just, it was just wowing to me. It was, I was awestruck at this realization that, that here we actually have the end game that McGillis sought in his earliest days that he lost sight of. The final dreams and hopes of Orga in saving Tekadon and making them have a prosperous future. All of these things came to fruition. That's why it was so utmost satisfying to me. I was mind fucking blown, but satisfyingly so, you know? And, and, and of course, not to uh, outdo Mr. Noblis, you know, he, he had been off Mars for a time. He came back, and we see that ride actually 
sort of uh, picked up that mantle of getting blood on his hands by answering to Orga's demise and such. Uh, again, solidifying that idea that Nobilis is people, even if he was not aware of where Orga was at the time. It was his people as an extension of working with him uh, that took Orga out, and so he meets his end. And he died on the toilet. Thank you, thank you very much. Nobilis has left the building. <laughs> <laughs> you know? um, but yeah, like I say, by the end, seeing so much of Tekadon, the survivors of Tekadon are, are leading prosperous lives now. You know, I, I mean, we get flashes and glimpses of some of them. Eugene is now the right-hand assistant of Cordelia in, in her governmental position as sort of the leader of Mars, if you will. Um, and, and that was awesome. You know, uh, seeing Takaki has his own place. Uh, he, he is surviving. He's living on. And he might even get into uh, the sort of, uh, you know, governmental role that uh, his, his sort of boss, if you will, uh, is currently you know, in the position of, and just all that stuff. I mean, they, they really saved the icing on the cake and the cherry on the cake for the end, though, as far as I was concerned. Of course, Cordelia, she wants to be able, she, she's talking all about how Tekadon, the survivors, are taking care of the human debris. There's no more human debris. They're, you know, abolishing that whole, uh, again, movement and everything like that, and they're taking these children in and giving them lives, giving them purpose, taking care of them. And uh, we see, you know, like the one big guy in Tekadon, it seems like he's working in an office or something like that. A couple of uh, the surviving Tewaz girls and stuff and, and whatever like that. Uh, apparently, Rustal's coming to that, you know, sort of uh, peace agreement with Cordelia was in part as a result of Ozzy and, and Tewaz. And uh, they're, you know, sort of riding in the middle there. And so... Again, they really saved the best for last in, in falling on Atra, who has grown up to a full-blooded woman now, a young woman, and her child is, you know, maybe three to five years old, something like that, <laughs> little Akasuki, and uh, he's adorable. He looks like, you know, Atra and Mika combined, literally. I mean, the, the character design, he looks like a young Mika, but with Atra's hair color. And uh, he is still monosyllabic in, in a similar sense to how Mika was. <laughs> And I was dying laughing. I was smiling through all of it. Uh, Cordelia wants to go home and, and see the man she loves, this young boy, um, who reminds her of that love lost. Uh, for those who thought that was really insane and divisive, I mean, I couldn't wrap my head around it entirely. But again, it was wartime. It was the way for these characters to try to make a prosperous, better future for themselves to come together. And in the end, it was only Atra and Mika who got together, even though Cordelia loved him perhaps as a romantic infatuation, perhaps as a, a brotherly love, a familial love, remains to be seen, is arguable, but, you know, by the end, it was just so great to see that little kid, and uh, uh, going back to the, the thing I don't want to hypothesize about, if they ever wanted to do a follow-up movie, you know, they could be dealing with a, a young adult, uh, uh, Akasuki, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, maybe he would be a little too much like Mika, but in a nurturing environment brought up with love and care and compassion i would hope that he wouldn't end up very much like his own father and uh you know it, it just again it all ended very satisfactorily as far as i was concerned um i i feel done with the story i feel like i, I need no more and i want no more and so yeah i mean uh all all things come to an end and in this case satisfyingly happily so uh i enjoyed watching the season at, at the beginning of the second season i you know it took me a while to really get back into it i didn't really get into it that much uh, obviously i wasn't covering it in uh episodic reactions or, or reviews or anything like that and uh it really was the the turning point like you know about midway through the second season when uh they hit Tewaz and uh we lost those characters and, and the laughter and everything like it really fueled my my frustration and my emotional outbursts and everything which is why i came back on camera and i wanted to talk about it and react to it and uh, i've been there ever since in a sense i've been doing this ever since but I, I feel satisfied. I, I feel like the story is done. I need and want no more. I, I you know, I, I don't want any more. I don't need any more. And uh, that's it. You know, all's well that ends well. Uh, all good things must come to an end. And if this be its end, I, I hope that's the finality of it. I, I hope we're done with this universe, this story, these characters. And uh, otherwise, I'll be really fucking pissed, <laughs> you know, in a sense. Depending on what they would do with it. Again, I don't want to even hypothesize. I feel like this was good enough. As, uh, as an end note for the series and uh so yeah i mean uh that's it that's all she wrote and uh catch y'all later peace